So, um, so this is uh, an introduction to conservation, a really obviously beloved topic for all of us who are in this field, um, at, but also to collaboration, because I really think that that's a very central facet of the work that we do, that we all do. So how do we define conservation of cultural heritage? So it's a profession that's devoted to the preservation of cultural heritage for the future. It's sort of the way we think about um, making sure that our kids and grandkids have access to the same cultural materials um, that we do now. Uh, however, um, and I'm just showing, I put this display of images because I wanted to represent for you just the incredible breadth of um, heritage as we, as we define it and as we care for it. Um, it's, it's quite broadly construed, right? So anyway, um, so this is a, a quote from this, this particular pr uh, publication, Conservation Concerns. So it says conservation embodies minimizing change and maximizing longevity. But I would actually say that, that in our current practice, we actually think about conservation as managing change. We really recognize that we're not going to stop change in, you know, that it's occurring to collections and materials. That's not simply not possible, but we could potentially manage it if that's appropriate. Um, but the other aspect of conservation that is so important and that we've been looking at more and more in recent days is that we, we need to kind of figure out who makes these decisions, who makes the decisions about what should be prioritized for minimizing or managing change and who should be, um, who should be deciding whether or not change is a positive thing or something to be minimized. And so that's where working collaboratively kind of comes in. Um, we need to have multiple voices in that conversation. Um, it cannot just be the conservator who says, I'm going to try to stop or minimize change. So this is actually um, part of a presentation that we give for um, educating people about what conservation is um, for uh, another project that, that Bianca, Nicole, and I work on. And so I'm borrowing this slide in a way um, to talk about, well, how do you become a conservator? And this will be familiar to some of you, but perhaps not all of you. So in our present day, you earn a master's degree um, in art conservation or cultural heritage conservation. And the preparation for earning this degree requires a very diverse background of coursework and experience. So we, it requires uh, coursework in humanities or social sciences. You can see those topics listed there. It, it requires a demonstration of capacity in the studio arts or applied arts so that you show that you have some ability to work with your hands. It requires a, back, a background of coursework in the sciences. And then what's currently under review, these are all under review right now. We're actually in a very interesting time, but typically traditionally pre-program internships have been required, which are opportunities for a, an individual to work under the supervision of a conservator for a certain period of time before going to graduate school. And then there's a list of all of these different specialties um, because no one conservator works on all different materials because we, our education takes us in certain directions. Our passion and our education takes us in certain directions and we specialize in um, any one of these kinds of, one or two maybe, of these kinds of materials. So I have a video um, which we also produced for 
um, disseminating information about the field of conservation. And this is, I hope this works. It's a video of the conservator at the Fowler who actually graduated in the first graduating class of the program with which I'm affiliated at UCLA. And he talks a little bit about his work. So let me see if I can get that to play for you. My name is Christian DeBrer, and I am the head of conservation at the Fowler Museum at UCLA. And I have been in this profession for 12 years now. When I was an art student, I was still very much interested in the materials that I was working with. I wasn't so interested in the kind of theoretical elements of, of art. And I found a book published by the Getty and it had these funky 80s pictures, but those 80s pictures were of people working in the tomb of Nefertari and working on paintings. And I just knew that that just looked like so much fun. So we have people from fine arts, art history, archaeology, and then also all in the sciences and chemistry. There's the side that kind of treats objects. So you're working on one individual piece and you're getting into real detail into it, learning about it, seeing why it's deteriorating and then treating it. And then there's a different side, which is the preventative side, which looks at how we can preserve the art and keep it from deteriorating for many years to come. It's kind of a small field. It should be much bigger. So it's competitive to get into. You have to also be interested in both art and science. You gotta use both the left and right side of your brain, you know? But I would say once you get in it, I mean, it's so open and it's never boring. And you're always learning as you're going through. Okay, so I never tire of that video. I just love it. Okay, <laughs> so there is a national professional organization for conservation referred to called the American Institute for Conservation. And they have outlined what they refer to as six primary activities of conservation. And you can see that I've slashed that out and made it seven. And so these are the steps that are described for um, the, the primary activities that are undertaken by a conservator. And I'll let you read those. Um, and I'm going to show you an example of a, a project that in, incorporated collaborative research and then a second project that incorporated a collaborative treatment. Um, and you will see that a lot of the um, additional steps, the documentation has been a significant part of both and um, preventive care is a significant part of both and education and outreach is also um, important in both of the examples that I'll share with you. So, Collections care as well as conservation require, I think, require collaboration. Um, this is uh, the subject of the first project I'm going to tell you about um, is the display lighting for red shafted flicker feather headbands. So on the upper left, you see an example of the kind of um, material that I'm going to be talking about. This, these, all three of these images were taken at the California State Indian Museum in Sacramento. And um, I became very, very interested in California feathered regalia and wondered about when we are exhibiting materials that are natural, naturally pigmented feathers, undyed feathers, what kinds of lighting restrictions are being placed on them by our museums now and what kinds of lighting restrictions are appropriate for these materials. So you can see that, that even though as a conservator, I can do research in this area, 
getting these items to be on exhibit requires already a huge collaboration within the museum. There's a decision being made about what to display. There are people that are making armatures to exhibit these materials properly. Um, there is a exhibition designer perhaps, or somebody who's building a case in which to put these. There's somebody making a decision about the lighting. They're all, and the labels, somebody's writing the label copy. So there are all kinds of collaborative decisions already being made um, it, within a museum proper. But as I said, returning to my interest, my interest had to do with um, the, the, um, the, the lighting for, um, the sleigh lighting for th these headdresses. So here I'm showing you an image of, um, that I took at this big time festival in Point Reyes, California, which is um, north of San Francisco, Point Reyes. And it's, um, there's an annual um, festival. Unfortunately, it didn't take place this year due to COVID, but it's a um, Pomo, Maidu and Miwok um, performative dance, series of dances, incorporating a great deal of feathered regalia. And you can see the headband that I was showing you in the previous slide. So this, this upper left image is being worn by two of the, actually it's being worn by, by many of the performers here, but in the dancers. So it is this, this um, feathered headband, these feathered headbands. Can you see my cursor? Yes. Okay, thank you. So these feathered headbands, they're, they're worn across the eyes. So they, they um, you know, sort of are intentionally altering your ability to view and what you're viewing. And they're made out of the, they're made out of shafts from um, a series of bird feathers that are then kind of stitched together into these long bands. And the center section is worn uh, closely against the forehead across the eyes. And the two ends are allowed to move freely. And this is our bird, our, our bird buddy from who gives up his feathers for these this for these headbands. So it's a red shafted flicker. This is a woodpecker that might be familiar to some of you. Um, indigenous to California, also up into Oregon um, and Washington. And um, the, the, the bird is typically, the appearance of the bird is sort of black and white spots. But when you look at the underside of the wing and the underside of the tail, there's a brilliant red orange color. And that red color, just keep this in mind, it's a carotenoid, which is the same thing that makes our carrots bright orange. So it's a biological pigment and um, it happens to be utilized by this bird to create this bright orange color. And the black and the black and white, the white is a lack of pigment, the black is melanin, which is the same kind of pigment that we have in our bodies as humans that colors our skin, pigments our hair. Um, so we use melanin too. And then just here's another example of a historic image in the California State University of Chico's collection. And this is a, a young Maidu boy wearing a flicker feather headband, although he's not wearing it across his eyes, he's wearing it above his eyes. And you can see that the ends, I think this just shows well how the ends um, are really allowed to trail the sides. Okay, so I got very interested in looking at examples of these headdresses across many, many museum collections. And what I kept noticing is that their color can vary tremendously. So what is that? Is it fading? Is it fading from being performed and danced under the bright sunny skies of California? Is it exhibition damage that's happened because these museums have made different choices? You know, what exactly are we looking at here? 
So one of the things I decided to do was to look first, of course, at whether there was a difference in the preservation of color on what would be the outward facing part of the headdress. So what I'm calling here the front, right? So that when it was worn by a dancer, the side that was not facing in, the side that was facing in toward the wearer would be the back and the side that was facing outward would be the front. And I, I began to see that, yes, in fact, the backs, what I'm calling the back, typically has a stronger preservation of color than does the front. However, I could have gone completely awry with that set of uh, assumptions because then I spoke to regalia makers who were very generous with me and with their knowledge. And they told me that actually they sometimes just flip them around when they're wearing them. So they, they, there is, so that the back front distinction is not one that's held in great importance. And I had numerous conversations with generous individuals like Frank LaPena, the late Frank LaPena, who is a Wintu, a was a, a, a Wintu um, tribal member and artist. Um, and I have an example here of, uh, on the left is one of Frank's paintings showing this feathered regalia. And in the center is a book that he wrote about dream songs and ceremony. And on the right is an image. So meeting with Frank at his home in Sacramento and meeting with other, other regalia makers and weavers who were who are Pomo and um, Hoopa. And so um, you see here at the upper left, looking at regalia um, with Susan Billy, who is a Pomo basket weaver and who incorporates feathers. And the bottom left image and the upper right image are Bradley Marshall, who is Hoopa and Karuk. And he's a re also a regalia maker. And then I'm substituting for an, an image for Mio Marufo. I'm substituting one of her beautiful uh, recent finger doodles, which actually shows the red shafted flicker um, on the lower right. So, so conversations with each of these um, generous folks um, increased my understanding. The other thing that I learned from, from um, from Frank LaPena was that um, returning again to um, looking at the regalia was that he told me that, that it, if in fact the ends became extremely worn, that he would trim them off. So the reasons why we see such dramatic differences in the lengths of those side flaps is because um, that's a kind of a, a conservation technique used by regalia makers is to, if the, if the free moving flaps get damaged, they can just be trimmed and tied off again. Because these birds are not easy to come by and they're not easy to, uh, it's not easy to acquire enough of feathers to make this regalia. So um, it was extremely interesting for me to learn about preservation methods that have been used. Um, the other thing that I learned is that the color is actually quite important. Um, when I asked some of these regalia makers, what would you do if your regalia lost its coloration and became you know, pale in color? And I have to say, I had to giggle when I was told I would donate it to a museum. Interesting. So then we turn to my sort of science side of things. And I use this method called microfading to determine the fading behavior of these red shafted flicker feathers. So this is at the Getty Conservation Institute. I was very fortunate to have collaborators there. They have an instrument that I don't have. And we did this kind of testing and I'll, I'll just show you quickly don't worry about this. I'm just kind of showing it to you and I'll explain it. So on the, on the um, left side, going from bo the bottom left corner, which is zero up to the top of the left 
side where you see the number one, that is a measurement of color change. It's referred to as delta E. Across the bottom, the horizontal, you're looking at the amount of time that we use to expose these, these feathers, three different feathers to um, very high intensity light that would be, that is filtered of all the ultraviolets. All the ultraviolet radiation is being filtered out and we're exposing these three feathers to a very high intensity light. And actually what this is showing us is that that is not a lot of color loss. If you have that, that Delta E on the left, if it is less than one, which it is across this period of time, that in our assessment, that is not even visible to our eyes. So clearly we're seeing something else on these on this regalia. So then we did another accelerated lighting study where we incorporated ultraviolet. We said, okay, so we're not getting much fading on these, these materials if we exclude all the ultraviolet energy. So now we took feathers that are culturally important in California. So the red-tailed hawk on the left, the mallard duck in the center, and then as another carotenoid, remember I told you that the red shafted flicker, it gets its color the same way the carrots do from carotenoids. Well, we substituted another feather that has the same pigment system, which is a scarlet ibis feather. And we use that. So what you're looking at here is these were placed in a very intense light aging chamber that included ultraviolet energy. And we covered, we masked off the sections between the red arrows. So have a look at that. Look at the one on the left where you see this very protected deep color on the top between the red arrows, but the rest of it was exposed. In the middle, you see between the red arrows, it's actually really hard to tell whether there's been any change in that mallard duck scalp. And on the right, what you see is this like incredible scary contrast between the brilliant color between the red arrows and the top and bottom of that feather that was exposed. Ellen. Yes. Um, Robert's asking if there's a heat component to the light. Great question. That is a great, great question. Thank you, because I can't see the chat. Um, there is a heat component to the light. We tried very carefully to not be raising the temperature too much when we did these um, studies, but we did raise it. It, it had to be raised like slightly above room temperature, I would say. So we couldn't eliminate with our equipment, we couldn't eliminate elevating the temperature slightly. You know, I will actually on that point, I will actually say that when I had conversations with regalia makers, they encouraged me to look at the role of perspiration in color change on feathers. And I've yet to do that, but I think again, temperature, increased temperature, and imagine when these are being worn and performed, the temperature is being raised by the body of the wearer, and there is also perspiration. And so these are all really interesting variables, and it's a great question. But I'll tell you what we were able to conclude. So what we were able to conclude in this study, and then I'll you know move on, but we concluded that actually ultraviolet radiation damages all feathers. It damages the color in all feathers. And not only does it damage the color, but even a white feather that has no coloration is damaged by 
ultraviolet radiation. So I didn't share those images with you, but it was a very direct conclusion. It was something that we knew, but we were able to demonstrate. And then the order in which feathers will fade under the same indoor lighting conditions. So it includes red shafted flicker will fade first. It will fade most dramatically under the same lighting conditions. Red-tailed hawk, which is a melanin pigmented feather, even though it looks kind of similar, that's one of the interesting things about feathers. Like you could have two feathers that look sort of like they're the same color almost, but, the, but their pigmentation is actually quite different. So red-tailed hawk will, will fade at a slower rate than the red shafted flicker. And white and blue feathers. So the blue and the iridescent mallard duck that I showed you are what are called structural colors and they will fade most slowly. And this information was not only disseminated to museum professionals, you know, presented and, and published, but we made a point of publishing the outcome of this study in news from native California and to reach out to regalia makers, you know, as a way to make sure that we were sharing this information with the, all of those great people who are helping us with this study. So this is work that's ongoing and work that I'm still interested in, in continuing to do. So next I want to turn to um, treatment, but also my teaching. I know, I know all of you know that I'm a professor at the UCLA Getty Conservation Program and Patty Garcia undoubtedly knows that I've done a lot of work with Agua Caliente in the years past. And so one of the ways in which I teach conservation to my students is so that they are learning from um, people from tribal communities who have knowledge to share about the materials that we're looking at. Um, and so you see these, these examples, I just sort of did a collage here. So on the left, we have one of my students who's practicing, you know, splitting juncus because she's just been taught by Roseanne Hamilton ab about plant gathering and how you split juncus. And then on the upper right, there is Roseanne um, teaching coiling to my students so they understand just how extraordinarily um, challenging basketry construction actually is. And um, at the bottom image are my students at the Agua Caliente Cultural Museum storage, looking at um, the baskets and selecting baskets, which we did together with um, the curators and weavers in terms of choosing items for conservation. Again, what gets prioritized? Who makes that decision? I'm returning back to that conversation. And then I, I would be remiss if I didn't share the black and white image in the lower right. This is um, the late Donna Largo, um, who was an extraordinary force behind revitalizing um, uh, basketry amongst the Kawea and she she was I we had the which is an amazing opportunity to have her teach my first group of graduating students and also the late um, Ginger Ridgeway who was the curator at that time is in that image too. So the other thing that happens is that we in our conservation labs at the Getty Villa we invite knowledge bearers from the community. We actually, we invite, there's a typical day where we make a potluck lunch and we invite many, many members from the community to come and share with us their observations about um, the baskets that are under our care at the time. So on the left is Cindy Alvitre, who is Tongva and Lori Siskwak who is Kawea and Apache in the, sec in the center top image. At the very left is Osge Genke Ustin, one of our alumna who's um, taken on basketry as a specialization. 
and Abe Sanchez, um, who is a master weaver, um, and Jan Timbrook, who is the former curator, the emeritus curator from the um, Santa Barbara Natural History Museum, and then um, actually Roseanne's late mom, who joined us um, in this gathering. You see Roseanne using one of our head magnifiers <clears throat> to look closely <clears throat> at a basket. So we, you know, we bring together a lot of people. We have a great lunch with the students, and um, we really really share information and observations. And we've presented this work, again, trying to reach out um, at UCLA as well to, to kind of, uh, you know, part of conservation is reaching out. And so you can see this little invitation in the bottom center to a, to a exhibition that we did um, featuring this collaborative work. So I'm going to actually finish with this case study of a treatment because I said I would also include a treatment. So this is a basket in the collection of the Agua Caliente Cultural Museum and it was taken up for treatment by one of my graduate students, Lily Doan. We'll do a shout out to Lily a little later. And you can see the kinds of documentation that Lily has carried out here. She has taken images of all the sides of the basket and the top and the bottom on the left and then on the right row you actually see that she's taken images using what we call raking light where the light is held parallel to the subject and it's designed to sort of throw the surface up into deep shadow so you can see the indentations you can see that the basket had lost some of its original topography um, and this was where we were going to need some help and guidance. Lily also took x-rays of the basket. So this is a twined basket that is either Tlingit or Haida. And we were very interested in the twining technique. And we were interested in being able to get back to the hand of the weaver by looking at how the um, diameter, the basket would start at a certain diameter. And in order to increase the diameter of the basket as the weaver was working, additional elements had to be inserted. So you start off with a certain finite number of elements and then you continue to add in elements to increase the diameter. And Lily's x-ray showed beautifully these elements being added in. So, you know, and, th and this, by the way, is a label that um, is, is showing up as a white rectangle. So I'm just showing, I won't labor these, but, just, and, but this was an extraordinary amount of work. Um, this is the kind of documentation that our students would typically do, that conservators would typically do. It's a documentation that details each of the tears and the deformation or distortions um, so that we can come up with a plan to figure out what would be the most appropriate steps for this basket. One of the questions that we would had to co collaborate about was that we did not know whether the, the um, protruding base of this basket, which I point out to you, in this ultraviolet image, let's see if I can look, there we go. Um, this protruding base, whether that was an alteration that had happened over time or whether that was an intentional part of the construction of this basket. This is an ultraviolet image and I'll talk a little bit more about that in the next slide. So we consulted with the late Again, too many people have passed. Um, anyway, so we lost Terry Rothkar to cancer um, way, way prematurely. And she's a Tlingit and Haida weaver working in Alaska. And we asked Terry about the appropriate shape of this basket. And Terry not only um, confirmed that this is a berry basket, 
that should have a flat base, but she also helped us confirm why we were seeing this purple stain, these purple stains under our ultraviolet. We could not see these stains until we put this under an alternative light source, ultraviolet, an, like a black light. And she helped us interpret what we were seeing, which is berry juice on this basket. So Lily then undertook a very complex treatment, which involved putting this basket into an, an, a, a humidity chamber with very controlled introduction of humidity. And we had to use a very concerted support under the basket and inside the basket. Literally, we had a glass plate, un foam covered glass plate under the basket and a weight, a heavy padded weight inside the basket in order to recover that very important flattened shape at the bottom. And of course, Lily also repaired all of the tears that you saw and see, you know, in these in these detail images, so that the basket is um, is now in a recovered condition. So I just wanted to say that this is the an after image of the basket. It's looking, you know, what we think is is um, we're acknowledging the hand of the weaver. We're acknowledging the original intention of the basket. Um, and I could not have done that without Terry's input. And then this is my shout out to Lily. There's Lily. Um, and um, the final step in every one of the treatments that our students carry out is to create a housing as part of that final preventive conservation. So we like to return things to Agua Caliente or any tribal museum we're working with with a, a housing that is going to protect the basket and you know and is also going to serve as an example that can be replicated for the collections that we're not getting to um, so that it can be um, as I said kind of rep used as a model for replication by the museum. <laughs>